Hello and welcome back. Let's now wrap up the story of Subramanian aspect of the Heisenberg group by comparing it to what the general Subramanian manifold looks like. So we start with a manifold, the Riemannian manifold. It comes with an inner product. It has a tangent space TPM at every point. But we look at a designated subspace of that tangent space at every point. And this needs to be smoothly varying, at least continuously. Therefore, we can think of, locally at least, some vector fields whose span produces this delta p. And as p varies locally, these x's change smoothly. So, so far, so good, and you can compare on the right to the story in the Heisenberg group H1, where these special vector fields were explicitly given by the formulas on the screen. And the subspace they span was called the horizontal subspace written with HP H1. Only with this structure, we can go ahead and define the Carnot cartesian distance. We call an absolutely continuous curve into the manifold, which is meaningful. Horizontal, if almost everywhere the velocity lies in this designated subspace. So again, the curves are restricted to having uh, velocities only lying in a proper subspace of the tangent space. So if you take any random curve between two points, it may not be admissible for what we're going to do. Because the Carnot cartesian distance between points will be the length of only those curves that are horizontal and join two points. So I'm not going to, of course, introduce the whole theory of Subramanian Geometry, I will reference to the right place to find more on this. I just want to compare using the explicit example of Heisenberg groups that we have studied so much to motivate how they are defined. So what made Heisenberg group work? The most important thing that we tried to do was to prove that this distance was actually finite and well defined. And for that, the key is to prove that despite the restriction on the curves, we can still travel between any two points with horizontal curves. Uh, in the case of Heisenberg group, we achieved this by looking at the projection of curves and the very detailed study of how length changed. And actually, we had this equality that the, the length of the horizontal curves were exactly equal to the length of their projections in the Euclidean geometry of the plane. And this very delicate equality was key to finding horizontal lifts of curves and using that to prove connectivity. But one might think this is just so tight, so close. It's almost like lucky that this happens. And if these equations, these equalities were disturbed even by smallest change, everything would break down. And that's fair. That's, that's a good comment. So we must ask, what is it that makes it actually work? Because let's think about, again, R3 as a manifold. And uh, what if we look at it in a different coordinate system? So how much of this connectivity is actually uh, really deep? And how much of it was just coincidence? The answer to this is what is called the bracket generating condition. In the Heisenberg group, it happens that if you take the uh, Lie bracket, in the sense of vector fields of uh, the vectors x and y, if at p you take their bracket, it actually becomes partial partial t precisely, or, uh, well, not so precisely, negative 4 times partial partial t. That means if you look at x and y and the horizontal space, then their bracket gives you the missing vector from the full tangent space of R3. Uh, so although x and y do not span the tangent space, if you allow them to also bracket within themselves, they do generate it. So we can 
then define bracket generating for delta p here by saying that if I am allowed to also add to this whole bunch of vectors also the span of all the possible uh, brackets of such vectors x i and x j's and even higher dimensional brackets maybe after I do x i and x j I obtain a vector and now I bracket it back with x k and so on so if it happens that um, adding the brackets to the span finally produces t p m then uh, we call this bracket generating. There are a lot of uh, variations and a lot of subtleties here. For example, this k here might not be the same from one point to another. Sometimes this span could already be the whole space. Um, but if that happens everywhere, then we're just talking about a Riemannian manifold because every curve would be horizontal and this will be just the usual distance we define a manifold. Uh, so at least not everywhere it is the case that this span delta p is all of tpm but if the brackets help span the whole tpm we call it bracket generating so a sub riemannian manifold is a um, pay a choice of a riemannian metric with a riemannian inner product together with a uh, what is called a distribution and we want it to be bracket generating. And the, there are theorems uh, due to Chow, sometimes called chow harmander also, that guarantee that under bracket generating condition plus some, uh, say, connectivity of the whole manifold and stuff, uh, it follows that if you have this condition, then every P and Q can be connected by horizontal curves and uh, we even have qualitative estimates uh, kind of Holder estimates on uh, how different distances are um, so as I said this was just to say where Heisenberg group stands in terms of uh, general sub Riemannian Manifolds. Subramani manifolds are also called Carnot Carathedri met metric spaces or Carnot Car Carathedri spaces. So that makes Heisenberg group a very special example of general uh, Subramani manifolds. Uh, sp specifically, H1 will be an example of three dimensional, uh, where dimension, uh, topological dimension of the manifold is three. Um, so H1 will be an example of them. But there's also some special place for H1. Um, and for that, we'll have to remind you of uh, what tangent spaces were. So if you had a Riemannian manifold, at every point, the tangent space is the special Riemannian manifold, the Euclidean space. So if this is a three-dimensional space, then R3 will be the tangent space at every point. So uh, Euclidean spaces among manifolds are very special because they are also tangents to arbitrary manifolds. W in three dimension, and only in three dimension, it happens that most often, given a three-dimensional subramani manifold, which is truly subramani and not the trivial case of being actually Riemannian manifold. So if you have a 3D Riemannian manifold, then their tangents, which need to actually be defined metrically, so this is not tangent in the sense of uh, coordinate charts and stuff that would just coincide with the tangent of the manifold. If you define a more intrinsic notion of tangent space, which is through convergence of metric spaces, uh, where you look at neighborhoods and then you zoom in, and but you scale so that you take away the shrinking due to just looking at smaller neighbors if you kind of renormalize so that you can compare then you take a limit of these metric spaces and that converges to another metric space and that that is called a tangent space to the manifold at that point so it turns out that for three-dimensional subramanian manifolds 
the tangent space is at most points the Heisenberg group so that makes Heisenberg group very special I mean H1 uh, that uh, it serves as the generic like 3D object, 3D subramanian object, tangents at every point are H1. So H1 is kind of the uh, Euclidean space of subramanian world. That's why H1 is so special. In higher dimensions, the tangents could be more uh, general group. So the resource that I mentioned beautifully written notes by Enrico Vedone. It's actually a huge book. Fortunately, it's for now free on his website. And the more fortunate news is that Professor Ledone has made um, amazing videos on the topic of subramanian manifolds and Karnakar theater spaces on YouTube. I must warn that his uh, lectures and notes are pretty advanced. Part of my motivation with doing these very explicit lectures on Heisenberg group was to give you some uh, example to have in mind when watching these lectures or reading these notes and uh, kind of making it more accessible to graduate students and uh, non-experts who want to learn a few things about, about these uh, fascinating objects. So definitely uh, check out the link I will have to his lectures. And uh, his book is uh, just uh, a treasure to have on your archive.